What's up, everybody? I know it's been a minute, maybe a couple of weeks or so, you know what I mean, since I last made a video. I've been tarred and feathered, no pun intended, in the comments about my last video that I made about the, um, the hottest guy on the internet right now, Mr. Dane Calloway, comes through, drop off information that shakes up the establishment. He's coming off a um, so-called victorious debate against Judge Joe Brown. I didn't see it like that, but that's how I've been seeing it, you know, reported in the YouTube streets, you know what I mean? The topic, loosely, was based on indigenous versus African, and it turned into a, a um, Illuminati Freemason Bible session and emotional hodgepodge, for lack of a better word. But anyway, it's Veterans Day. Shout out to all the veterans. I honor their service. You know what I mean? I could never serve this country in its current state in that capacity, but I respect those who do. You know what I mean? Some some people just warriors, man. They just gotta fight, you know what I mean? Even if they even if they fighting for the wrong thing, they still gotta fight, right? It's a lot of shit been going on, a lot of things that I didn't speak on. You got the big Astro World fiasco that was just it was so it was so many satanic signs and symbols throughout the whole thing. But that's what we call in hip hop now. You know what I mean? I've been I've been up on all that symbolism shit and all the shit that they do in music and at these big events, things like the Super Bowls and stuff like that. They like to play out rituals and this and that, and you know. Like, it's almost like I crossed that stage a long time ago, like when in my back in my Alex Jones and Black Child days, right? I really don't pay close attention to it like I used to. But just at a glance, you know what I mean? I can see that shit. You know, it ain't worth really speaking on. This guy. This guy, Travis Scott, right? It's weird, you know, I got, you know, I got sons between the ages of 19 and 23. And you know what I mean? They listen to a lot of rap and hip hop and all that. You know what I mean? We from Georgia. They like the down south shit, you know what I mean? Basic shit, everybody else listen to. But one thing they do, they don't listen to no goddamn Travis Scott. That shit is fucking corny. I didn't even know, it's crazy. I'm just out of touch, but I didn't, I had no idea how big this dude was. I really didn't know who he was. I would hear a song on the radio every now and then with this guy doing this weird, this weird yelling in the background. And I found out that that's him. And I was, every time I would hear it, I'd be like, why, what the fuck? Why, why would he put that in the song? But so much for that shit. All them, all them fucking, um, these big time rappers, you know what I mean? They got shit going on. But that's not why I'm here. Hold up. I'm gonna run off the road for a second because I got to speak on this shit too. This fucking, um, Kyle Rittenhouse trial, right? I've been following it very closely ever since they, they um convened the jury and all. And I've watched this goddamn blatant, outright white supremacist judge just make all these crazy rulings and crazy comments. Like he's, I think he like, I think he probably getting ready to retire or something and he don't even give a fuck no more. He ain't even trying to hide what he doing. See, the only time you see a trial where the judge and the prosecutors are going at it is when it's a cop, a, a cop, or any random white supremacist on trial, and the victim is black. In those situations, the judge seems like you know he, he joined the defense team. He he warns the defense team. He 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 guides them down certain roads and certain very important rulings that he knows the case swings on. He'll rule against the prosecution. I said prostitution, but shit, it, it still fit. It could be prostitution with them fucking whores up there. But Okay, I'll give you an example. All right. The, the prosecutor was cross-examining Kyle Rittenhouse, right? And he was walking him down the road of intent. You know, why was he there? Why he had a weapon? And what was his intent, right? So, man, they got so many videos. Drone videos, handheld videos, news camera videos, helicopter. They got videos out the ass of this shit, right? And so, this one particular video is where... They were setting fire to a store, right? And Kyle Rittenhouse was passing by. 
and he was yelling at him, you know what I mean? I wish I had my gun, I wish I had my AR-15. So when that came up in the trial, the judge refused to allow that into evidence and just fucked up the whole line of questioning and then just um, took the jury out and just went off on the prosecutor. So they got this thing going where, you know, every now and then they have to demonstrate that white people can get away with anything when black people are the victim. It ain't a damn thing that um, you can do about it. And the reason they do that is because in a system like white supremacy is based on rewards and punishment. When you uphold the system of white supremacy or take one for the team, you get rewarded. When you go against it, you get you get what the victims in the Kyle Rittenhouse case got. You get dead. So listen, that act, a white supremacist killing another white person in the name of white supremacy and because the white person was aiding the black people against white supremacy that is a high honor like they really want to see him walk and it's for the future but all right i'm about to get to it okay my main man indigenous preacher mr dane callaway he dropped a little video today and he's like doing an overview of the cast of the movie um the harder they fall the western i think was put out by jay-z and it's um it's a fictitious story using real people as the characters and he's about to go through and you know i, I don't know if he's gonna break down the movie or or he's just gonna break down the characters because i haven't looked at it i kind of want it i kind of want to do it live like this so um you know what i mean you get the real reaction okay my expectations is that he will go in and um, bring you some, some factual information, some things that you probably haven't heard before, some things you might have, you know what I mean? I was introduced to the black cowboy and that a cowboy was, was really referring to a black person as in, you know, the white supremacists, you know, um, black person can never be a man, he's always a boy. And they, they was dealing with cattle and a cowboy and it made a lot of sense and I found out about um, a few um, black cowboys that was back in the West. And in this movie, this one character, Cherokee Bill, he even spoke a little, another language. It probably was, it probably was Cherokee or something. And that he was supposed to be a, um, a black Cherokee in the movie. Now, let's just, let's just get into it. See where it go. This should be fun. Y'all hear that? Spooky music, Dane. Once again. It's always raining in his videos. I'll see you, everyone. Today, I just wanted to share with you some background information concerning this powerful movie called The Heart of a Fall, which is a modernized version of a fictional American. You know how I am. I got to interrupt. Okay. I just noticed Dane Calloway's um, logo symbol. It was an eagle that morphed into the symbol. All you um, Masonic and Illuminati types, take a look at that symbol and um, put it in the chat, put it in the comments if you see anything. I'm not saying that I see anything because I just saw it at a quick glance, but let me know. Proceed. That's the movie directed by James Samuel and executive produced by hip hop pioneer Jay-Z. Mm. Now, even though this movie is fictional, most of the characters portrayed in this movie are real people. And this was right up Jay-Z's alley to produce due to his uprising as a child. Jay-Z has mentioned before that his father's love for the Cowboys lifestyle drove him to become a fan of the Dallas Cowboys football team, even though he was born and raised in the state of New York. I grew up, my pop, my pop is really my pop taught, you know. He, he, grew up, he grew up in, yeah, that, that era, that, that era, those guys who, you know, wanted that, that whole Cowboy lifestyle. Now, before I go any further, I want you to be aware. Irrelevant fun fact. He's known for those. Mr. Calloway, I'm talking about. That some of the information that I'll be presenting in this video could potentially spoil the plot of the movie. So if you haven't watched the movie just yet, then I suggest that you pause this video and go watch The Heart of the Fall on Netflix. I highly recommend it. How considerate of you, Mr. Calloway. And I'll see you again once you've completed it. And by the way, no, this is not a sponsored video. I'm just simply appreciating the great content I watched personally and would love to share more information about it with you now. Now, I can confirm that eight out of the 13 characters displayed in this movie are real people. Some were outlaws, some were lawmen, like sheriffs or mayors, and some were, of course, the real cowboys of the 19th. The question is, how many of them 
were of pure Indian blood. No mixture from white, no mixture from black, which is African, which is a word that Mr. Callaway steals away from. That's what I'm listening for. I'm listening for proof of the heritage, right? Because this is the way I see it. There was a Native American phenotype, dark skin phenotype, already present in this country before the arrival of the European. I'm convinced of that through, through research and, and reading, right? Now, now I can confirm that eight out of the 13 characters displayed in this movie are real people. Some were outlaws, some were lawmen, like sheriffs or mayors, and some were, of course, the real cowboys of the 19th century, even though mainstream Western films of the 1920s and beyond gave the real Indians minor roles in their films, usually depicting them as comedic characters as a joke, while all of the cowboy roles were given to pale-skinned foreigners to be depicted as such, allowing for the next generations to come to believe that prominent cowboys of America were mainly of pale skin, when that is absolutely not true. Absolute fact, Dane. Absolute fact. All right. The question is, how many of those black cowboys were Indian? No African descent, just Native American Indian descent, right? In the title, you said that the cowboys of the Wild West were Indians. I'm paraphrasing. I might be fucking it up. But you know, the general thing. I'm expecting you to prove that to me with this video. That's what I'm looking for. Here we go. Let's see if he does it. The main protagonist of this movie was a famous cowboy by the name of Nat Love. But to some, he was known as Deadwood Dick, being as though he was a consistent rodeo winner of Deadwood, South Dakota. Nathaniel Love was a veteran cowpoke, a professional horse rider, and proficient gunslinger that could track down stampeding cattle and rope wild mustangs with ease. It was said that fear didn't exist in his blood due to his Cherokee heritage by way of his mother and father of Davidson County, Tennessee, where he was born and raised. His fearlessness came from his Cherokee side. No mention of the other side. Typical romanticization of the Native American. On his family's plantation in June of 1854. Now, it was said that he published his own book in 1907, in which he describes in detail his life as a cowboy, and on page... It was said that he wrote a book. Did he write a book, or was it said? 99 of this book, he describes being shot and wounded and captured by Hold on. Hold on, we gotta catch this part. Let me back it up a little bit. name of Nat Love, but to some, he was known as Deadwood Dick, Deadwood being as though Dick. he was a consistent rodeo winner rodeo from Deadwood, guy. South Dakota. Nathaniel Love was a veteran cowpoke, a professional horse rider, and proficient gunslinger that could track down stampeding cattle and rope wild mustangs with ease. It was said that fear didn't exist in his blood due to his Cherokee heritage by way of his mother and father of Davidson County, Tennessee, where he was born and raised on his family's plantation in June of 1854. Now, it was said that he published his own book in 1907, in which he describes in detail his life as a cowboy. And on page 99 of this book, he describes being shot in... Wait a minute. You're giving us what it says on page 99 of an alleged book? Um, you're bringing us information not from a primary source? Not you, Dave wounded and captured by a band of Pima Indians, led by a man named Yellow Dog. He describes the Pima Indians as being, quote, composed largely of half-breeds and people of colored blood that eventually nursed him. The Pima Indians, composed of half-breed and people of colored blood. See how your voice saying the word African? That's what the colored blood is, African, okay? Already mixed Indians. Then you bring in African blood. I'm just keeping track of everything you say. We're going to keep it pushing. Back to help. He shares that these Pima Indians respected his Indian heritage so much that they promised him 100 ponies in return if he joins the tribe and marry Yellow Dog's daughter. But after a month <laughs> in captivity, he steals a pony and escapes 100 miles west in 12 hours. 100 
100 miles in 12 hours on horseback. He was a riding motherfucker. That's all I got on that. The main antagonist of this movie was a famous outlaw named Rufus Buck. Rufus Buck, Buck lived a rather short life due to his... I think that was um, Eldris Eva, Eva in the book, in the movie. Uprising as the leader of the Rufus Buck gang of Oklahoma. Buck was born to two Creek Indian parents, and for this reason alone, it was said by Harvard Magazine that, quote, he dreamed that his gang spree would trigger an Indian uprising that would expel... Harvard Magazine? So we believe in that too, right? I'm just documenting. Let's go. The illegal white majority and reclaim the whole territory for its native people. End quote. To many people, they were heroes. But the Rufus Buck Gang's violent redemption campaign abruptly ended after a total of 13 days, when all members were finally caught, tried, and hanged. Rufus Buck was living fast and died young, witnessing his last afternoon at... Seems to be a theme here. Everybody getting hanged. Just 18 years old in Fort Smith, Arkansas, on June 1st. Mr. Callaway, I have a sincere um, video request for you, you know what I mean? Being as, you know, you're such a great researcher and you dig up the facts like nobody else, allegedly. How about put together a video about the uh, Native American warrior class and let's... Um, Document some some um some of their victories um, that seems to be missing from a lot of these stories, right? And I'm sure um, a researcher and a filmmaker like yourself that'll probably be an easy task. So I'll be looking forward to that in the future, Mr. Callaway. But until then, let's go see. 1896. The Harder They Fall also portrays another real life pioneer named Jim Beckworth in the movie, but officially known as James Pearson Beckworth of Frederick County, Virginia. He was known as a mountaineer and a professionally skilled fighter, which earned him the nickname Bloody Arm, and he made his living. Hey, man. This guy looks just like Frederick Douglass. I don't know if y'all can see that. Can you see that? He looked like Frederick Douglass a little bit. As a fur trader, but was apprenticed as a blacksmith during his earlier years of life. He was born in April of 1798 to an American Indian mother mm. and a white father. Mm. Rumor says that his father was his slave master that later freed him from slavery during his childhood in 1824. Mm. But what's not a rumor was the fact that he became the chief of the Crow Nation of Indians just a few years later, while respectively leading. I see a pattern with this country. They love to elevate mixed breed people to the top especially black people, you know, indigenous people, however you want to say it. But that, that seems to be a practice. They elevate people of mixed race to the top. And more times than not, it's to the detriment of the people. The Dog Clan for many years. He also married the daughter of another Crow chief prior to leaving her behind in order to volunteer with the United States Army to fight in the Second Seminole War in Florida in 1837. He details more about his life in his book, which was published nearly 20 years later in 1856, called The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth, Mountaineer, Scout, and Pioneer, and Chief of the Crow Nation of Indians. Two other characters portrayed in this movie carry a rich history when it comes to the American West of the 19th century. Hmm. So in this collaborative effort to present more information concerning this matter, I asked Texas' very own Chief Topcats to join me in presenting their background stories to you. The gold is going to all right. I don't even know who Chief um, Top Cat is or whatever he said, you know what I mean? I think that's going to be all for Mr. Callaway. And in my opinion, he failed to prove the statement from the title. Tariq Nasheed um, introduced a lot of people to the black cowboy of the Old West in um, one, of the hidden, one of the hidden colors films. I'm not sure which one, but he did that. That's when I learned about Bass Reeves, and I don't know why, I don't know why the hell um, Bass Reeves wasn't mentioned in this video, but yeah, and um, I did a little research and found out that basically anything, anything that involved physical work in this country in those days, black people dominated it. You know what I mean? We are, we are, we are more, we, we built better for physical work than anybody else. 
So, you know what I mean? I, I'm not surprised that a cowboy, that black people did, um, you know, worked on ranches and worked horses and all that, and they was the best, and they learned how to do the shit with style and flair, just like we always do these days. But Mr. Callaway accuses um, those such as myself who have basically, basically a, a, a pan-African ideology, you know what I mean, that, you know, we've been fooled and we idolize and romanticize Africa for no reason when we really from right here. But what I say to that is you are trying to convince the people to do the same thing in another direction. And like, you know what I mean, once so much, so much time, so much time passes, so many things have changed, so many different languages and, and dialects and, and, and semantics come into play. You can't really, you can't really prove a lot of historical things, especially the farther back you go. You know what I mean? But but what you can, what you can prove is that you live under a system of white supremacy right now, right here today. And the reason why you targeted and attacked and chosen to be at the bottom is this right here, that melanin in your skin. So no matter, no matter how it got there, where it started, it is what it is. And I'm saying that to say we don't have time. For this discussion when it's a war going on and this your boy bless the best your host to the next post